Our gospel reading this morning is uh, from Matthew, and we're going to read chapter 11 and verses 2 through 15. When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. Truly I tell you, among those born of women, there is not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been subjected to violence, and violent people have been raiding it. For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John. And, if you are willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who was to come. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Even if the uh, sound system is a little... <laughs> 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 Last Sunday, we were introduced to a Bible character named John, specifically John the Baptist, because there are several Johns mentioned in Scripture. And uh, we took note of his clothing, which was camel's hair, and his diet, locusts and wild honey, and his message, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. But apparently when I was talking about John last week, I made one error. I told you that John the Baptist would never show up on the cover of GQ magazine. Could you cue the photo, please? Just a second. <laughs> One moment, please. Here you go. Okay. Maybe it's not going to show up this morning either. Central theme of John's message. 
Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. On this third Sunday of Advent, our theme is love. Question, would you consider John's message to be a message of love? I would, and I do. Because, you see, to warn a person who is in danger is a loving act. If you see a blind man about to step off the curb into the street, and you know that there's a speeding car coming down that street, what are you going to do? You're going to stop that man. You're going to warn him. You're going to do everything you can to keep him from getting hurt. That's love. If you warn a lost sinner who is in danger of judgment to repent and turn to God, that too is love. Now, John, like Jesus, and like other rabbis of the time, had followers called disciples. Disciples are committed followers. When we talk about making disciples here at DCC, we're talking about making people into committed followers of Jesus. In today's story, John sends his disciples to Jesus with a question. And the question is this. Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? That's in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 3. When he talks about the one, he's talking about the Messiah, the anointed one. We often use the word Christ, which means exactly the same thing as Messiah. And how does Jesus respond to John's question? This is his response. Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. And the good news <coughs> is proclaimed to the poor. Wow. Jesus knew that sweet words alone would never convince men and women that he was who he claimed to be. The <coughs> evidence that he offered was in the form of action. Jesus performed acts of love and mercy, the like of which have never been equal. Now we tend to think of love as a feeling, right? It feels so good to be in love. One guy said, I felt scrinkless all over. I was sure I was in love until I found out I had a vitamin deficiency. <laughs> love is more than a feeling. Love is an action. Love is what you do. Amen. Jesus showed God's love for people who were lost and hurting by meeting their physical and their spiritual needs. Jesus fed the hungry, he healed the sick, and in a few cases, he even raised the dead. Wow. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear, and the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. I want you to notice, the good news is proclaimed. That's part of the action that Jesus takes. It's a major part, and it is with a special emphasis for those who are poor. People who are in real need are often the most responsive to the message of the gospel. There are Christians who will argue that mercy ministries and acts of social justice are just as important, if not more important, than sharing the gospel. Indeed, there is an urgent need for social justice and for mercy ministry to meet physical needs of hurting people. This week, I have been reading David Platt's book, Something Needs to Change. And he writes about the things that he saw while on a trek in the Himalayan mountains. I had an opportunity to be in the Himalayas many years ago. The world's greatest mountain range. The Rockies would look like foothills 
placed next to the Himalayas. But the people who live in that area are desperately poor. All kinds of challenges face them. Sickness is a very common thing. Hunger is very much a part of their lives. There and in other parts of the world where I've had opportunity to travel and even live for a time, we've seen amounts of human suffering that boggle the mind and break the heart. We've been in places where there was the threat of mass starvation. Places where AIDS, the disease AIDS, has infected a high percentage of young adults so that they are unable to work. I've seen a man with leprosy whose foot was gone and whose body was being eaten away by that corrosive disease. I remember meeting a crippled man. He was, he was set out to beg on a, on a little platform about four inches off the ground. And he had no legs at all, and it looked like he had no hips. It didn't seem like there was enough of him there to even be alive, but he was. And those are terrible, terrible things. And it's hard to understand how people can be brought into a world where they have to suffer so. Right here in Canada, right here in Delisle, there are people with tremendous physical needs. We've heard about these kinds of needs this morning. And we need to do all that we can to meet those needs. But we must also realize that temporary earthly suffering, however painful, pales in comparison to the reality of eternal suffering, separation from God forever in a place that the Bible calls hell. Here at DCC, we take the Bible seriously. And that is why we share the truth and the love of God in a world and a community where there is an urgent spiritual need. As I thought about these things this week, I wrote in my journal, and I, I want to share with you a paragraph that I, that I wrote in my journal this week. In every part of our world, there are people with tremendous physical and spiritual needs. Both types of needs are urgent, but spiritual needs are most <coughs> critical because the eternal destiny of human lives hangs in the balance. I believe the Bible, all of it, even the parts of it that I don't understand. I believe that the Bible is God's word to us and not just a collection of people's ideas about God. In the Bible, the main things are the plain things and the plain things are the main things. And the main point of the Bible is that God wants to have a relationship with us. A relationship of love. A love relationship that will last forever. Jesus taught us that the most important commandment is to love God and to love our neighbor. And Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment of all? He said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your soul. And he said, the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. We love God because God loved us first. And he sent his son to be a sacrifice for our sins. The best known verse in all the Bible tells us that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. We love because God loved us first. Now I have a question for you today. What is the opposite of love? Most of you probably think immediately of the word hate. But you know, 
There's a, another word that the Bible sets up against love, and it is fear. Fear. <coughs> the Bible says perfect love casts out fear. Too often we fail to love people, not because we hate them, but because we are fearful. Afraid, perhaps, to get involved. We're afraid to step out of our comfort zone. Afraid of the liability that might be incurred. Afraid to take a risk, especially if those people are different from ourselves. When we love like Jesus loves, that love will overcome our fears. And we will love people in need as we love ourselves. In light of all the urgent physical and spiritual needs around us, I long to be a part of a church that loves people like Jesus does. A church that is truly focused and committed to doing the most important things, caring for hurting people with compassion, and speaking God's love to hopeless people with real courage. I want to be a part of a church that is fearlessly holding on to God's word while selflessly sacrificing to share and show God's love in the face of all the crying needs in our world. In other words, a church that is loving God, loving people, and making disciples. What are we here for? Loving God, loving people, making disciples. Let's do it together. Loving God, loving people, making disciples. I want to be a part of a church like that, because a church like that can change our world. Let's pray. Father God, help us understand today that love is much more than a feeling. Love is the actions that we take to meet the needs of hurting people for the glory of God. We want to do a better job of that. Father, I want to do a better job of loving like that. Help us all to love like Jesus loves. To love with the love of Jesus, which he has placed within our hearts. Make us that kind of a church. A church that is loving God, loving people, and making disciples. Amen. Amen. Let's join together in our closing song.